if as Mike starts his chat, you've got any questions, please pop them into uh, the chat box and then I will feed those to Mike kind of at the end of the session. So any questions you've got, just jot them down in that chat box. If you don't, if you've not used Zoom very much, if you scroll your mouse kind of over your screen, a little green, a little um, box, little chat box appears sort of in the middle of the screen down at the bottom and it says chat and you just click on that and on the right hand side appears a little list and you can like type messages into people okay fantastic um also throughout mike's session as he's chatting he's going to talk about some different subjects in that chat box i will put some links to some kind of things that maybe are relevant to what he's talking about and they might be resources that we have on our website they might be resources from um Devon wildlife trust they might be from the um Bat conservation trust so do keep your eye on that because there might be something interesting popping up in that chat as well fantastic so um i'm going to talk a tiny little bit about the project and then i'm going to pass over to mike um so the project has been running is it five years mike i've been involved yes, for four years. It's been yeah. running for five years and there are three main strands to the project my strand is community engagement so people um so i was i well up until six months ago i don't think i need to explain why things changed six months ago i was going into schools and working with school working with community groups running events like walks and talks and bat swims and things like that also our um kind of connecting with the communities also um like the website or social media and things like that there's also a second strand which is knowledge and that's kind of us finding out more about greater horseshoes um, and then the third strand is what kind of Mike's role is in the project and he, he's called a farm advisor but you don't just work with farms do you you also work with you know it's small holdings landowners um com different community groups that you know so, like within villages and things like that so it's not just kind of farms although his your title's farm advisor it's not all that you do is it really those are the only people you work with fantastic um so i think i'm going to just pass over to the so mike is definitely our bat project bat expert and um he it, because he's on the project he was has enabled us in the past to like show us bats in situ and we've like climbed up sides of barns haven't we and crawled into <laughs> spaces and he's because fully Mike, risk assessed yeah fully, oh absolutely fully risk assessed yeah uh, so we could see greater horseshoes in a we went somewhere near harberton didn't we and it's the most exciting thing this big dusty barn with this tiny little bat just <laughs> kind of hidden in this so that was very exciting so i thank you very much for that um i'm going to pass over to mike i think that's enough introduction i'll be quiet for a bit if you need anything just let me know mike great Cheers. Thank thanks, you, mike. yeah thanks for that, that kind of intro i'll just um just got a presentation so i'll just share my screen and then uh we can get going so So hopefully you can see that. See that okay? Um, yeah. So thanks. Um, thanks very much, Lizzie. Um, so yeah, good, e good evening, everybody. Uh, yeah, my name is Mike. Um, I work, as Lizzie said, I work as a, a farm advisor um, for the Dem Green Orchard Bat Project. Um, for tonight's talk, um, it's entitled to Bats in Devon, um, but we're going to start with a little bit of kind of general information um, about bats. Uh, and then look then look more locally in the Devon context um, and focus a little bit on the on the great horseshoe bat um, as that's uh, sort of the area that certainly we've been focusing on for the last sort of five years and perhaps probably know know the best um, and it's, it's a real local speciality so I'll finish with a little bit on the great horseshoe bat and then perhaps talk a little bit about things that uh, you guys can do if you want to get more involved in in, uh, in looking at bats and, and to learn a bit more about them um, and then, as you say, we can we can take questions at the end. Um, that she'll be monitoring the monitoring the chat, so we can have a bit of a chat, a bit of a discussion afterwards, hopefully. Um, so, 
So if we start off with, you know, what, what's so special about bats? Um, I think they're you know, a fascinating group of animals um, for, for a number of different reasons, really. I, I mean, one thing, they're incredibly long lived, which I think perhaps a lot of people probably don't, don't quite realise. Um, I think the oldest known bat um, is, a, is, is a Brant's bat, which is a bat found in the UK, but also across, across Europe. Um, and that was found to be at least 41 years old, which is, and that's quite a small bat. If you think of um, you know, a similarly sized, you know, small rodent, probably live one or two years, something like that. So very, very long lived. And I think probably part of the reason for that is um, the way the bats live and have this kind of winter period when they're in, in torpor a lot of the time and they really shut their body down to, to save energy. Um, I think that's thought to, uh, to extend their, their, uh, their lives. Um, they are certainly not, um, not rodents. Um, again, if people say, oh, you know, flying rats, horrible things. Not, not the case at all. They're um, not, not closely related to, to rodents at all. Uh, they're in their own, own separate order. Um, and they're the only true flying mammal, which again, there are other species which um, some, some things like sugar gliders, um, some sort of flying uh, squirrels, things like that. They kind of, they can glide. They've got flaps of skin, they can glide um, as they're kind of moving through a woodland, um, but they're not sort of true flying mammals as such. Um, it's only the bats that can do that. And, and the name, the, the order for bats that they're grouping is uh, Chiroptera, which literally means hand, wing, chiro, or the hand, and then terra um, to do the wing. Um, they're very intelligent as well. I mean, they can, if you think about their echolocation, um, there's lots of different calls in there that they're using. Um, and the terms of where, how they live in, in these kind of quite complex um, social groups as well, and using different roosts. Um, there's, there's actually quite a lot of intelligence there and a lot about them that, to be honest, we don't, you know, we still, still don't really know. Um, so there's lots, lots more to find out. And so li linking on with that, um, I mean, this is actually a question that I've been asked a few times uh, over the last few years, which um, is a bit of a shame. In one, I mean, on one hand, I'm sort of hoping <laughs> that I'm kind of preaching to the converted uh, on tonight's, uh, tonight's talk. Um, but, you know, they're fascinating animals in, you know, in their own rights, uh, I think. But um, they do also fulfill a really you know, vital uh, role in, in sort of ecology and in ecosystems across, across the globe. Um, particularly for, for pest control, natural pest control. You can save a lot of money. Um, on, you know, there's a figure there from, from US agriculture. Um, I think that was a few years ago, but $3.7 billion per year um, that they are, they are saving as, as a natural pest control for, um, for crops. Um, and for pollination, again, not, not, obviously not in this country, but in the tropics, um, a major, major sort of uh, pollinator various species and also for um, important for seed dispersals so actually you know, have, have a role to play in, in reforestation um, in, in some areas. So very, let's say, as well as being just amazing things, I, I, yeah, I love bats, so they're fantastic, but they do also fulfill this really, this really vital role as well. Um, so in a bit of a global context, just before we, we look at, um, look more locally, there's about, so the numbers kind of vary depending on where you look really, um, to what source you look at, but there's, approximately sort of 13 to 1400 species of bat across the globe um, I think by some of the latest counts um, and that makes that makes one fifth of all of all global um, mammal species as, as bats um, a very diverse group um, there's a couple of pictures there just showing sort of the, the two ends of the scale really so on the left um, we've got the golden crowned uh, giant golden crowned flying fox which is a huge great thing so a six foot wingspan um, all the way down to very the smallest bats, such as the kitty's hognose bat or, or the bumblebee bats, which are on, on the right. Um, so yeah, very great, great diversity of, of sizes and, and, and shapes and, and, and colours and, and, and all sorts really. Um, most species are found in the tropics, with only only about fifty uh, in Europe, um, and then a, a, a small number in, in the UK. But see that, that tropical diversity is quite is, is quite you know special really quite striking I mean, for example in in Costa Rica which is a um, you know, fabulous country for wildlife there's that's only what so twice the size of Wales something like that that's the size of the country and yet they've got about 110 115 species of bats um, so it's you know they're getting on for about 10 percent of the of the global bat diversity which is you know which is, which is quite amazing 
but uh, yeah, so really, really great, uh, real, real diversity of species. And again, just a few more, just a bit of an excuse to, to show a few more uh, nice bat photos. Again, just showing some of the, uh, the diversity, diversity again, really, these are all, all Af African species in, um, from Tan Tanzania. Uh, got the heart-nosed bat on the top left. Um, top right is a Mauritian tomb bat. And again, I love the shape of that one. You can just see how that could be kind of tucking in, in sort of crevices and up there. Uh, you know, really kind of flattened body shape and then bottom left you've got another of the, of the fruit bats that's the uh, Wahlberg's epauletted fruit bat which is a nice little one and then the yellow winged bat on the bottom right so again just some uh, just yeah fantastic diversity of, of, of species so if we look in the in the UK context um, we've got 18 species here um, plus occasional vagrants as well so there's um, I mean, some of the vagrants um, might be more more frequent than, than we know about because um, if they're if they're ones that were just under recorded and we're not you know perhaps we you know I'm sure we are missing them in in, in, in certain locations but but certainly they're only recorded rarely and that would be species like um, Cool's pipistrelle, Savvy's pipistrelle, and um, party coloured bat, um, which are sort of quite widespread in parts of Europe but certainly um, not not so much in the UK just just occasional vagrants. Um, so we have eighteen and seventeen of those um, are breeding. And there's there's one the greater mouse bat which uh, which isn't used to but but not anymore. Um, so we've got greater horseshoe bat on the left and, and a barber stell uh, on the right. So very distinctive with the big broad ears that sort of meet meet in the middle. Quite quite distinctive ones to to, uh, to look out for. And all, all the UK bats are insect eaters, um, and they're all relatively small. I mean, often on the project, um, if I'm talking if I'm talking. You know, to landers or, or leading walks, we talk about the greater horseshoe as being, you know, being quite a big bat um, with about 40 centimetre wingspan, which is a fair size. But in a, in a global context, when you talk about all the uh, all the fruit bats and other species, there the UK bats are relatively um, or relatively small. So in terms of what they need in the landscape, um, it's it's a sort of a, a variety of different features and different habitats, all within a fairly close uh, proximity, really. So they want good, good networks of, of, of good quality habitats, and nice hedgerow networks, um, areas of woodland, watercourses, areas of standing water, um, species rich grasslands, areas of farmland and, and cattle grazing and old barns to, uh, to roost in. Um, and typically Devon is, is very good for that in, in a lot of places is, is very good, um, good county for, for bats and, and a lot of other wildlife as well, of course. So we're actually doing, doing pretty well. So we've got uh, 16 confirmed uh, uh, bat species of, I say 18 in the UK, we've got had, um, had 16 in, in Devon. Um, there's, I mean, there's a few rare ones in there, obviously Greater Horseshoe at the top left, which is one I'm normally banging on about. Um, but a few other ones in there, so Lysers, that's, that's um, don't give me records of Lysers down, down here, but have been recorded. Great, Grey Longeared on the bottom left, that's, that's a very rare one. Um, got colleagues who do do work on that on a, uh, another project down in, down here in Devon. Um, we've also got yeah the Becksteins. That's been quite a rare one over, over in East Devon. It's got a bit of a bit of a stronghold. Um, and then the Pipistrels, um, common and soprano in particular. Um, Nithiusius less so, but common and soprano, but a very very common species. So the two that we're missing, just just two. As I say, Greater Mouse Eared on, on the right. And then Alcathoe um, on the bottom left there. Now, the greater mouse here, as I mentioned, um, so we used to breed here. Um, there's, there's a few roosts of, of this species, um, but I think it's declared extinct in about 1990. Um, and then there's a little bit of, bit of a gap where I think there's hardly any records or, or, or no records at all. And then one, one individual was, was found. Uh, in a disused railway tunnel in in Sussex in 2002, um, and they put a ring they put a ring uh, ring on that bat, and that basically that that same individual has been returning um, to that same tunnel every year, every winter uh, for the since then basically every year since 2002. Um, it was a juvenile you know, when it was first first found, um, so that's you know it's going on for you know 20 20 years. Um, I say they are quite long lived, so we could expect it to, to keep coming back for a few few more years, but uh, don't know how uh, how many more. Um, and we don't know where it goes each summer. It just disappears. It goes, yeah, goes somewhere else, and then it reappears again um, in the next, the following winter. 
a um, bit, of, bit of a local uh, celebrity in, in the bat world down in, down in Sussex. Um, and Alcathoe is uh, that bottom left one. It's very similar to another, another couple of bats which are um, themselves very similar uh, and that's the Whiskered and, and Brant's bats. Um, both quite small, small species. Uh, and Alcathoe was, was only separated from them in 2001 um, uh, and Whiskered and Brant's uh, themselves were only separated, I think, in 1970 or early 70s. Um, so very, very similar group of uh, group of species, um, and you know, you really, only you need sort of DNA analysis to um, to be sure um, of, 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 that you've got Alcathoe. Um, so I think it's you know, it's a case really that there could there could be Alcathoe here in Devon already um, that we don't know about. We just haven't uh, haven't, haven't sort of tested and, and, and recorded it confirmed um so yeah so who knows they could be here already um but so far uh, there's been no confirmed records um to date in, in in devon and most you know most bats will, will be using buildings so they'll be found in, in areas um around human habitation um they can probably be loosely grouped into these different uh, different categories um that, that are shown there um based on how they, yeah, what what they need from a roost, what their requirements are, because certain species need need different things. So, again, from one end of the scale, I've got the pipistrelles, the, the smallest species. Um, you know, they can fit in tiny tiny little cracks and don't don't need big big areas for, for roosting. Um, down to yeah, the other end of the scale, things like like the greater horseshoe, being that uh, bit bigger, um, and they actually need a big a big entrance to the roost so they can fly sort of unhindered uh, into the roost. Um, and then hang up and have a good flight space within the, within the roost. So they need sort of, um, you know, typically big, so open old barns, things like that, are, are, are really good for greater horseshoes, just to give them that, um, you know, that, that space that they need. Um, and the, the horseshoes tend to need a little bit more space um, because of the way in which they roost, so they're, they're the only species, um, so the British species that really kind of completely free hang um, by their feet, all the, the other bats in the UK need at least some part of their body uh, supported. So these other species you'll see will be kind of tucked in crevices or uh, may look like they're hanging or, or half you know or a lot of their body will be hanging free but there'll be a little bit of their um, body supported in in, in some way uh, so if you're if you happen to be in, in a building and you see bats completely um, sort of free hanging uh, just by the feet then that's uh, that's going to be one of the one of the two horseshoe species um, species like Noctul and, and Becksteins, I think, probably aren't haven't listed on that list there. Um, they generally don't tend to use buildings very very much. Uh, they're, they're mostly in um, sort of tree roosting, so I don't think they're um, yeah haven't put them actually on on that on that list there. Um, bats use different roosts at different times of the year, um, just to again make it a bit more more complex when you when you're talking about sort of bat conservation. They they tend to use different roosts at, at different times, different locations. Um, so in summer and winter, they'll be using different areas. Um, sometimes they'll be using the cave, the same cave system. Um, for example, in, in Chudley, they, use, they tend to use the same caves in, in really, but also winter, but they tend to move to different areas of the caves too. Some with a slightly different temperature dynamic. So in, in winter, they'll go to you know, a cooler part of the cave and in summer, go to a, a warmer area, things, things like that. And then there'll be other roosts in between. So they'll have transitional roosts that are used in between their winter and summer um, roosting areas. Uh, and, and other roosts as well. Um, they use uh, what we call night roosts as well. So when they're out foraging of an evening from the main roost, they'll then um, go and perch uh, in, in another roosting location um, to digest their food as, as a bit of a break during during feeding, and then they'll carry on. Um, and those structures can be quite small, small areas that you wouldn't particularly think were um, particularly interesting uh, or particularly valuable to look at, just a little out, outbuilding of, of some kind. Um, or, you know, as I say, quite small structures they, they can be using. Um, so yeah, be using lots of different roosts at different times of the year. And all, all bats um, and their roosts are protected by law. Um, and that, that covers the roosts um, even when they're not being used, or when bats are not present. If it's an active roost, um, so you've got evidence of bats using it, but the bats aren't actually there at that time. It's still, it's still a protected, uh, protected area, protected roost. Um, so just we'll talk a little about Devon Bat Survey just just briefly. Um, so, so Devon Bat Survey, I don't, some people here um, on, on this talk tonight might might have taken part. It's, it's basically a survey that we, the project, have run 
the past past few years has been it's been amazing been really really popular um and it's basically where participants can can borrow a bat detector we've, got, we've had 20 uh, different locations uh, across the county um people borrow a detector free of charge put it out in their garden or area of land where they want where they want to put it uh it basically it records you just set it up and it records any bats that pass pass it um people then send send the data on a little a little data card a little sd card into us um, we analyze it and then send a report um, with all the uh, all the bats that have been recorded on from that from that session it's been it's been very popular as i said um i think to 2250 uh, different households have taken part and it's generated i think 3.2 million sound recordings something, something like that and it's been just a, a really good example of of engaging people with bats and, and it's using you know getting people enthusiastic about bats but also generating some really good and interesting um you know data from it so so this still it doesn't on first first glance probably that doesn't look particularly uh <laughs> easy to see what's what's going on 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 with this one um but basically on the uh on the left hand side on the on the, the y-axis going up you've got the number of bat passes and it starts it's zero then ten thousand then increments of, of ten thousand up to a hundred thousand so that's number of passes and then on the bottom you've got the um the bat species um going from, along from from left to right um you've got so from left to right you've got greater horseshoe then lesser horseshoe barbastel common pipistrel soprano pipistrel um nathusias pipistrel and then long-eared bats of brown and gray long-eared bats together then you've got serotine uh, which are the orange and then noctule lyslers and then the yellow on the far right is the uh, myotis group so that's species like the whisker and brants i was talking about um naturas dorbentons becksteins they're, they're very difficult to tell apart on, on the bat detector they have very similar calls so we tend to um we tend to lump them together because we can't really be sure which which ones um, which ones they are so we tend to for the purposes of, of uh, this survey um we tend to lump, lump them together but you can see that yeah pipistrels obviously um off off the scale you know about a third of all, all records um featuring common pipistrel and then soprano pipistrel you know almost almost half that and you know in terms of what mo you know, most people are likely to encounter um around their you know, around their houses um, it, it will be the pipistrel species um you know they're, they're you know very common <clears throat> excuse me very adaptable um kind of generalists really uh they, they can fit through tiny gaps and uh for roosting um they don't tend to mind uh, you know urban areas and, and, and lighting as much as other species um so if you see you know if you if you see a bat uh, a bit early in the evening kind of flitting around over, over the back garden um chances are it will it will be a pipistrelle one of them, common or, or soprano um maybe something more interesting but the you know, the vast majority of the time it, it probably will be one of the pipistrelle species but actually that probably follows and some of the other kind of abundances here so noctual Again, noctual tends to come out quite you know, early in the evening. Flies quite high in a sort of relatively kind of straight fashion. Looks, you know, and it's a big bat. It looks um, again quite quite striking if you, if you see one. Um, I think mean, yeah, greater horseshoe and you know, lower numbers. Barbastel low low numbers. Um, but it's quite that. Yeah, the, the trends on here are, are quite interesting. And just yeah, linking into um, the greater horseshoe, so I just want to talk a little bit about focusing on, on the great horseshoe because it is a bit of a local you know, local speciality devon's a really you know key area for it um it's one, it's one of our longest lived bats uh, up to about 30 years although it, typically it's less than that it's, it's probably more you know on average more like so sort of 10 10 to 12 years um something like that um it's um generally up to one young a year um and again only only, only really from about age of six do they start um start having young and then and then typically it's only one every two years then so actually it takes um uh, an, an infant mortality is quite high so it takes a while to build up these populations um and then actually uh, which it, it can be a problem because of course if something if something catastrophic happens to a roost or there's a real big problem and numbers crash for you know whatever reason um then it just tends, it does tend to take a bit of time for these populations to, to you know to recover and get back up again so it, it can be uh yeah it can be a bit of a worry sometimes um particularly you have large roosts with lots of bats in, in one place you tend to think oh if that something happens to that roost that's you know there's a lot of bats that uh, 
uh, potentially, you know, potentially at risk. Um, and numbers have over the last 50 to 100 years have, have really um, you know, come, have crashed really by up to about 90%, I think some estimates are, um, which obviously is, is, is really worrying. But thankfully, more recently, so I think the last kind of, you know, maybe, maybe 10 years or, or so, there has been a little bit of an upward trend again, um, which obviously is, is, is very pleasing. Um, so numbers are, let's say, uh, certainly have stabilised and, and, and if anything, do seem to be creeping up a little bit. Um, which is great, but there's, there's about, we reckon there's about 10,000 greater horseshoes uh, in the UK, um, and about a third of, of those are, are in Devon. So as I say, it's a real, you know, really, really strong, real stronghold here um, down in the southwest. And the, and the biggest, you know, the biggest roost um, on the edge of the moor down near Buckfast Lee, um, and that's about 2,000 bats um, in that roost, and, and this year it was, it was very high numbers in, in this year, which was, um, yeah, which was, which was good. Um, so a little bit more about, about the greater horseshoe. Um, you can see on the, the photo on the left, the sort of the characteristic nose nose leaf shape, which um, obviously the horseshoe shape, which give, give, gives it its name. Um, and that's through, through the echolocation that, that they sort of use that for their echolocation, um, and it produces quite um, high frequency calls, so tend to be higher frequency than, than the other kind of UK bats. Um, and it sounds very different if you are ever. Um, uh, on a bat walk or you, you're lucky enough to, to hear one with a bat detector it sounds the horseshoe bats sound very very different to um all the other uk bats um it's more like a sort of a warbling almost rather than a, a series of kind of clicks that you, you tend to tend to get with the other species um but it's a and, and so the, the reason for it is it's, it's that different mechanism so where most bats are uh, the other species are kind of going along sort of basically kind of shouting through their mouths in, in quite a kind of broad uh, kind of you know, spill as, as they're kind of calling as they're, as they're flying along um, to get that echolocation to get that uh, that bounce back. The greater horse uses the nose leaf instead, and it's a much more uh, sort of directional call. Um, doesn't have that wide spill, um, and it actually makes them quite difficult to pick up on on back detectors. Um, so it may be that actually we're you know we're missing some. On, 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 I'm sure in some situations they are they are being missed. Um, because it's almost like if the bat, if a greater horseshoe is kind of flying past a detector, uh, it's almost like if it sort of turns its head the other way, it's you know you won't pick it up because it's it's such a directional call. Um, so we probably are missing some, but having said that, they are you know, they are in no doubt still still a you know rare bat um, in the UK. Um, I think it's it's quite a nice little analogy there, saying it's like you know flying greater horseshoe is like a person in fog with an effective you know, sensory range of only five. It's, um, it's yeah, it's about it. Um, but it does mean they need features to navigate off if they're if they're kind of moving across a landscape. Um, things like hedgerows are great because they can keep um, you know tabs of kind of where they are by getting that bounce back from from features. So they tend to use linear features um, rather than crossing open spaces, for example. Um, little map on the on the top right there. Um, just showing the, the the global distribution of the greater horseshoe so you can see it kind of a bit of a sweep across southern europe and then all the way across to japan um but you know here as you can see we're, we're right on that kind of northern extremity of, of of its range um but as i say that you know we do have some good some good numbers here, here in Devon, so they, you know, the landscapes and are obviously uh yeah to the species liking and in terms of the, the diet of the greater horseshoe um Moths are, are very important, so 40% of the diet is, is moths. Um, and that's particularly some of the, um, as it's a bigger bat, it's ten, some of the bigger species they tend to go for, so some of the hawk moths. Um, large yellow underwing, some of the large noctuid moths. Um, yeah, large yellow underwing, heart and dart, if any. Uh, any mothers amongst, amongst you? Um, so those, those large kind of chunky ones they tend to go for. Um, Solitary wasps flies um they tend to take advantage of, of different species at different times of the year as as i suppose you, you would expect um so in in the spring cockchafers a uh, great food food source and then towards perhaps the autumn time then you know crane flies you might go hatching they'll 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 tend to go for those um and dung beetles uh, you know, beetles in general particularly dung beetles um are very very important particularly for young bats i think when they're First, taking their flights around the, around the roost, um, they're particularly kind of small dung beetle species, um, uh, the genus Aphodius, um, which are, are particularly kind of favoured food of the young bats because I think they 
those beetles aren't particularly good flyers, um, so they can, they can catch them uh, uh, more easily. Um, and that links to a, you know, sort of an area of work on the project that we've been spending quite a lot of time on, um, which is actually uh, parasite management of, of, of livestock, um, because it's actually the types of wormers that, that landowners use on their, on their cattle, on their you know, sheep. Um, can have quite a significant impact or effect on the dung beetles that will be able to use the dung because some worm and worrying products are very very strong and almost render the dung sterile so you won't get many beetles and things coming in and as I mentioned great horses like to feed on the dung beetles um, they are then uh, adversely affected um, by the use of some of these products so that's sort of a, little, a little area of work that, um, that we've been spending a bit of time on the last sort of year or two in, in particular which is uh, yeah, which has been been quite interesting. Um, you can also see from that that um, large dung beetle, you know, through the winter. So, uh, you know, as I think as I mentioned earlier, um, great horseshoes will um, are occasionally active during the winter. They don't tend to um, shut down completely, so they will slow down and have, have periods of torpor where they are um, they really slow down their metabolism and and become you know much less active. But however, if weather conditions are suitable, um, they will come out and, and hunt. So. Uh, in winter time, there are some dung beetles which which are active, and they'll they'll be the ones um, that you know, they'll be going for. Obviously, there's not there's much food around in winter, so they probably won't be out foraging for as long, and then you know they'll go back in to try and save energy again. But they, they do come out and forage uh, during the winter time. And actually, it was quite interesting. We did some research up in um, Braunton. Uh, some volunteers uh, really helped us with, which was, which was great. They put loads of detectors out through the winter just to sort of try and find out a bit more about you know their activity in, in levels in winter, um, uh, and actually coincided with the beast from the east if you uh, if you remember that back in early uh, 2018 was that um, and they basically they found out that they were or they recorded them leaving the roost and, and foraging when it was zero degrees C um, Celsius at night, which is you, you know you'd think it'd be you know too too cold for them to be going out. Um, so you don't know, we don't know how far they're going and how long they're staying out, but certainly they were leaving the roost and going at least, you know, at least a few hundred meters, um, more than just a you know, nip in and no, you know, get out and know it's too cold back in. They were going out at least some some distance, um, and actually looking at the data from that, we 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 found that it was more um, sort of precipitation actually and, and rainfall that was uh, more of a, a sort of a an affinity or. or uh, um, connection with that activity rather than temperature. Temperature didn't have seem to have so much of an effect. It seemed to be, but rainfall uh, did seem to. So that was that was that was quite interesting. Um, this is a little heat map. So this is generated from the Devon Bat Survey that I was mentioning. This is all Greater Horseshoe Bat records that have, have come to us through the Devon Bat Survey from 2016 to 2018. Um, and you know as, as you'd expect um, they're mostly centered around uh, the known roosts. Um, but, there, but there are some other interesting areas as well. So we have found some new uh, new records there, which would suggest there might be new roosts or you know, roosts we don't know about, um, or new key areas of foraging that we um, we need to follow up. Um, there's certainly, as I say, we, the main clusters in South Devon, uh, which we know about, and up in up in the north around Brompton, uh, around some known roosts. But uh, there's, there's, I think there's some info there that we need to follow up for, so for future work. Um, there's, I think there's some good, good info there that we can really have a look at and, and try and learn a bit more about how bats are using other areas of, of the landscape. Um, and we actually found bats in about, I think it's 35% of all, um, all surveys that, that have taken part, which is, which is probably a higher figure than we were expecting, um, but obviously very pleasing. It's good to know that they're, um, uh, they're being found in, in, in more areas than, than we previously thought. Um, you know, some areas quite you know, close to in and around Exeter, um, which, which was interesting. Again, we you know, weren't expecting, so it'd be a little bit too built up for it. But certainly, there are, are dark, little dark corridors around Exeter that they can um, they can be using. So that's um, yeah. So that's that was very interesting. Um, and yeah, so most of, most of my work, as, as Lucy said, is is with um, is working with landowners um, around to you know, live and farm around uh, the, the key roosts. Um, and you know, what we're trying to do really is, is trying to get um, you know encourage landowners to manage their land in a more bat friendly way so uh, that's all about managing and, and protecting these uh, these key habitats that, that are shown here so species rich grasslands um, to attract insects which would be good you know good food for the bats buildings areas areas for roosting um, trying to encourage woodlands to be managed in, in um, quite kind of openly with lots of open space um, 
great horseshoes being uh, you know a larger bat um, don't tend to like dense woodland they find that those areas more, more difficult for, for moving around so more, more open areas within woodland and, and woodland edges are very important. Cattle graze pastures as I've just been talking about the, the, the issue of, of, of worming and how, how important that can be um, and then and tall shrubby hedgerows as I've said it's um, Hedgerows are very, very key fe features for greater horseshoes in particular, other bats too, but, um, particularly greater horseshoes with that, that narrow kind of directional call that they, they need features to be um, sort of navigating off um, for, for a lot of the time. You know, there are a few exceptions where you, you do pick them up in more open areas, but um, a lot of the time it's associated with those, those linear features. And then hedgerows in themselves will be you know, attracting moths and other insects as well, so they can, they're, they're a food source as well. Um, as well as um, sort of uh, commuting routes um, for you know for the bats, um, I think there's a few. I've just put up this slide here, which is a bit of a bit of text on here. So apologies about that, but I think it's probably just useful to have a um, just a you know, very brief overview of, of um, perhaps some of the achievements of, of, of the bat project in, in um, sort of with our with lander working with landers to to uh, enhance habitats around these bat roosts. So we've been working with a lot of a lot of landowners, um, about 450 we've, we've um, had engage, engagement with and have been to visit or have come to workshops. Um, and we've held you know, lots of workshops. Um, we've done, uh, we've, well, we've handed out over 50 small grants through what we call the Bat Work Scheme. And that's, so that's mainly grants for habitat creation works um, that will benefit the bats, whether that's hedge planting, orchard creating, you know, planting or creating a new orchard. Um, community works as well in that as well, so working with, with school and community groups. Countryside stewardship, um, for those that don't know about that, that's a, a government scheme uh, which pays uh, or gives payments to landowners to manage the land in a certain way to benefit the environments. So that could be, for example, using you know, lower fertiliser amounts on, on their fields or cutting the hedges less frequently, um, things like that. And so we've been working with landowners to, to put in these agreements and make sure that uh, you know, bats are taken into account as much as possible. So we, you know, really trying to get in uh, particularly key, perhaps key habitat connections or key hedgerows that, we, that might be linking good areas of habitat. We want to make sure they're protected and they're put into um, enhanced management regimes or um, sort of reduced cutting or looking at, at laying hedges, planting new hedges, um, and just trying to, as I say, trying to kind of make those nice habitat connections through areas of rough areas of grassland and little bits of, of woodland and. Uh, orchards here, here and there and, and other habitats where um, you know where the opportunities lie. Talk about priority habitat I've put there um, that that doesn't necessarily mean species rich habitat but it just means habitat that the bats will be using uh, or be, will be of, of value to bats um, and that would be things like cattle graze pastures um, rough field corners scrub wood, you know, areas of scrub and wooden edge um, th things like that and lots of yeah lots of lots of hedgerows that keep um, yeah, keep, keep talking about. And it's just a nice example I just wanted to put up um, a, a little uh, habitat creation work we did in uh, in Dartmouth, or cl close to Dartmouth, I should say, uh, to a little bit outside. Uh, and it's, it's, there where it's just a nice example, I think, of um, you know, working with a landowner who, who wanted want to do good things on, on their land, um, was, in, you know, was interested in the project, um, how we might, might work with them. Uh, so they, they came to a workshop we then went and visited them and, and had a walk around um, and they basically wanted to turn this arable field into a wild flower meadow so we, we you know, had, a, had a chat about that and um, ended up giving them a, a grant for some wildflower seed um, so we turned uh, that area into now looks a bit like that which is um, hopefully uh, we see a lot a uh, lot more species rich in terms of sort of the wildflower diversity um, it's, it's absolutely buzzing with insects um, and you know, bats have been recorded there uh, using this area now which is great um, and you can, I hope you can see that's pretty much the same same view so if I just flip back one you see that tree on the horizon as the sort of point of reference um, so it's, it's pretty much taken from um, from the same location and as I say you know, lo loads of insects there um, and we're hoping actually with this site that we'll, um, we'll designate it as a uh, county wildlife site, which is a you know, local designation um, to sort of, you know, to, uh, you know, to sort of, um, I suppose just give recognition really that it's um, of the high wildlife interest that it now has. Um, so it's just a nice little, yeah, nice little example of 
as I say, um, habitat creation which benefit insects and, and the bats have, have, um, have, have been using it and, and are benefiting. Um, and as I say, hopefully we'll be recognised with, with that designation. We've also helped to um, build a few, well, yeah, a couple of new roosts and, and helped um, make some adjustments and, and improvements on others. This one was quite a nice one um, because it was uh, over in East Devon, a roost that was basically falling down as a maternity roost that was in really poor state of repair. Um, and we, you know, we felt that we couldn't, the, the existing building, we, we couldn't really do anything um, with, and there's some complications with, um, with the landowner at that site. So we thought, let's give them an alternative provision um, close by and, uh, and, and hopefully they'll start using that. And so this was, we did some survey work close by, found out that bats were using this area great horse bats using this area and, and other species um, and the landowner we, you know the landowner is very keen obviously which is uh, very important um, he was keen to help out and um, yeah great horse bats have, have, have found it already and they've been they've been using it which is which is fantastic um, they haven't been using it yet as a uh, maternity roost but the hope is that in you know in time uh, the level of usage will you know will build up um, and yeah, in time hopefully they, they will use it use it um, for that um, but certainly at the moment they're, yeah, they're using it and they've you know, we found good evidence of them uh, in, inside the building um, and around and in and around it, which is, which is great. So we just want to, uh, to keep our eye on, I think, um, over the coming years. But as I say, good, good initial, uh, you know, initial signs uh, are very, very positive. On that. And there's a couple of other routes we've helped with as well. We've helped make some little improvements, um, which again, you know, so, so far um, have um, Seem to be being successful, and we've we've had good, um, excuse me, good areas of uh, good numbers of bats using these new areas. So just sort of yeah, finishing up really before we, we go into um, you know, some questions and a bit of a, a bit of a discussion. But if there's things in terms of what um, you know, if you want to find out more about bats, what I think what you can do, I think um, probably you know probably the number one thing would be to you know join your local bat group. Um, so yeah, Devon Bat Group here is uh, you know, great and do lots of good. Uh, lots of activities, lots of good work. Um, obviously, in a you know <laughs> in a typical year, they'd be doing lots more bat walks and getting together in groups. But um, obviously, with current restrictions, that's somewhat more difficult. But um, I think certainly, yeah, getting to basically get, getting sort of share, sharing knowledge and, and getting together with other kind of enthusiasts and, and, and learning from other experts is is really uh, is really key. So. And you tend to find if you go on, you know, if you go on a walk when, let's say when, hopefully, yeah, we're allowed to start doing uh, doing walks again. Um, many numbers that you know, you'll find that most bat enthusiasts are really keen to share their knowledge, um, and just you know, it's it's just a really good way to learn basically by 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 joining joining a walk, um, having a little go on a detector, and 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 uh, yeah, immersing yourself in the world of bats because it says it all. Fascinating. Well, all comes alive, comes alive at, at night, really. So it's um, it's yeah, it's really interesting. And then I say, if you if you if you feel that's really got you interested, um, then yeah, perhaps trying to you know, look at look into buying a bat a bat detector, and then you can, you know, start looking for bats in in other places at home, on, you know, on your own a little bit as well. Um, again, which is great, great fun, um, as, as well as going on obviously going on other other walks. Um, I'd also say take part in the Dem Bat Survey if you haven't done already. Um, so there's a little bit of a, a little bit of a uh, sort of a, a caveat with this in that unfortunately our project is coming to an end um so we're due to end uh, in in january but we are hopeful that the dumb bat survey will continue in some form so we're, we're hoping that Devon wildlife trust um uh, in some capacity will will continue the Devon bat survey um but as i say it's the detail of that at the moment is, is, is not quite uh, is not quite there so we don't know exactly which you know how many there'll be which centers that kind of thing but we are very very hopeful that you know, we'd love to try and try and run it again next year so keep keep an eye out um for that in in, uh, in next for next year and then probably yeah probably the final thing if you've got yeah if you've got a garden um little small area just try and make it bat friendly so um you know tr attract uh plant lots of wildflowers trying to attract insects um and in, in turn uh will be attracting attracting bats it's it's funny it's kind of you know insects you know where the wildlife trust is, is doing a campaign on action for insects at the moment and, and really trying to bring people's attention onto that so it's on, on one hand it's a little bit kind of uh yeah funny for me to be saying yeah attract insects so the bats can come and eat them 
but of course you're attract you know you're attracting insects and you know uh, you know the bats aren't gonna aren't gonna eat all of them um so you'll be benefiting but you know you'll be benefiting both um there's lots of wildflowers you know, different species you could plant um and i mean you know things like you know primroses um are great early season ones you, and then knapweed scabious um oxide daisy things like that are really good um but also like here some of these nice kind of showy um things like you know poppies and corn flowers corn um corn cockle corn marigold species like that are, all, uh, are really good as well um so it's all about trying to in increase that kind of in insect uh, abundance in the garden and then, then the bats will uh, you know will come in creating ponds obviously you know ponds are great for a whole range of wildlife but again including bats because they'll come they'll they'll be feeding on um on the insects and if it's a you know a big enough pond they might be coming to you know the bats will be coming to drink which they'll uh which they do on the wing as they kind of skim low and, and, uh, and might be taking a drink from there so you can attract bats bats in that way and, and it doesn't have to be a big space it can be quite small small areas um you can try and you, know, you can try and do something with um just sort of hanging baskets or you know just use what you you know what space you've got really um to do your yeah to do your bit and I think that's probably, I've probably grabbed it on for long enough. Um, but I hope that was, yeah, I hope that was just a bit of a brief overview um, of some of the work and the project and, and the local local bats. And um, yeah, I'm happy to take questions. I don't know if Lizzie's got any waiting for me or... That was great. Thank you so much, Mike. That no was problem. great. Um, I, I was just, no, I just had a couple of, a little couple of questions came up and I wondered if yeah. they, so how, it went with the new roost how did you entice people i was going to say people then but that was <laughs> they're not the key people that are your things how would you that's kind of maybe enticed into that new roost um i think the yeah so there's, there's a couple of things there isn't i think the first thing is obviously lo, you know so location um so we did as, as i mentioned we did a little bit of work um, a bit of survey work around a few, you know, a few areas around, uh, close to this, you know, the roost I mentioned that was that was falling down. Um, so we looked in a few areas close to that to see, you know, where might be a good location. Um, so based on the results of, of, of those surveys, which was putting out bats tastes to see where, you know, where grid oysters were using, um, we found a good a good hedge line that seemed to be um, quite a regular route they were using. So we thought, oh yeah, perhaps if we put it close to there, then. As they were coming past, they'll you know they'll notice a different yeah you know, different feature will come up when they're echolocating. They'll sense there's something different there, um, and they, and they'll you know they tend to be quite kind of uh, inquisitive or, or of new things if they get used to they're quite habitual. So if they're used to using a certain hedge, for example, and then something is suddenly different close to it, they they might tend to you know go and go and check it out. So we put it close to where we knew um, was a good good route for them, um, hoping they sort of hoping they'd find it. Um, and then, of course, we then have to think about, OK, we've got the bats there and how do we encourage them to then start using it? So we try and make it obviously as suitable for roosting greater orchards as possible. So we have um, it's very sort of dark inside, which they, which they like because they're very um, kind of light averse. So, for, you know, for roosting, they, they need it nice, nice and dark. So there's some sort of baffles inside um, to, to keep the light out. Um, and also they like it um, for breeding, particularly, which is what we're hoping. Um, they like it nice and warm. So we put in um like a little kind of little false little ceiling and then there's a little kind of hot area where um just to, to basically just basically trap the heat into the little little kind of boarded off section of the roof space um mm -hmm. which we're hoping they'll use so yeah it's that combination of knowing where the bats are, are going to be using and then and putting it sort of close to that and then once we've uh, hoping they'll check it out and then make it so that once they do check it out it's you know it's to their liking and so they'll want to kind of keep coming back there basically does that answer your question? Um, yeah, that does. I was just because there was. I know there was a roost in. Um, uh, they put a new roost in at the donkey sanctuary in Sidmouth, and I believe there. Yeah. Am I correct in thinking they knew that lesser horseshoes were roosting there, and they kind of double layered the roost in the hope that the 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 the, the graters might see the lessers and think, oh, there's a there might be somewhere nice for us to kind of go and roost in there. And I just, it's, you know, you could put a big sign up, but they don't really yeah. read signs, do they? That's not the... No, that that's right. I think, I, yeah, I mean, I must admit, I, I think, yeah, I think you're right. I, I don't know all the, all the details of, of the Donkey Sanctuary roost and, and, and the history of that one, but um, that's actually quite, you touched on quite an interesting point there with, you know, lesser and greater horseshoes 
together. I mean, there's there's some kind of almost kind of differing research on that. Actually, in some in some cases, um, they've been found to to you know sort of coexist in the same roost, but in like in different areas of the roost. But in other areas, they found out that lesser horseshoes have been using an area, and then greater horseshoes have come in. And the lesser horses all gone. They basically desert. They tend the greater horses tend to kick the lesser horses out. So um, the big boys. Came yeah, I know it's a tricky okay. one. But then, I say on on our recent back conference, um, Tom Kitching from the Vincent Wilder Trust was saying you know, he knew of a roost where the lesser horses and greaters were in the same roost, but the lessers were like in a quite a sort of a little tucked away corner that like almost only they could really access, and um, the flight space was a lot more contained, and the graters you know found it a bit more difficult. So they tended to stay out. Mm -hmm. And then there's different access points, so you know the lessers didn't have to come through the graters to get there, kind of thing. So um, that's actually quite an interesting point with the you know, that kind of shared usage. Mm -hmm. um, in winter, it's less of an issue. When they're hibernating, you tend to get graters and lessers, you know, quite close together. They don't seem to mind it then. But um, in summer, they they tend to like the generally have separate areas. And and as I say, there have been a lot, you know, have been cases with lesser horseshoe roosts deserting. And greater horses coming in, so it's always a, a case of yeah, by working on the greater horseshoe bat project, maybe we're kind of setting the paving the way for a lesser horseshoe bat project later because we're kind of <laughs> we're kind of kicking all the lesser horses out. So now we need to help the lesser horses. <laughs> but, um, wow. it's, quite, it's quite interesting how that's uh, yeah that, how that works. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's great. Thank you. And it was it's really great to hear that there is an upward trend in those numbers. Yes. Yeah, that's really? uh, that's right because we've had those huge you know historically huge declines, but. Um, but as I said, you know, recently the figures tend to suggest they are they are doing you know on on an upward trend, which is, which is great because obviously the roost zones are in in a way kind of under increasing threat with sort of you know, development and lighting and things like that. Um, uh, so there's potentially there are more more pressures on those roost zones. So the fact that they are still doing well, um, yeah, is, is obviously great. But um, it's, yeah, certainly not a case where we can relax and, and and job done. I think we still need to you know keep an eye on things. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I also, there were a few comments that came in. Richard, who's currently the new um, sort of development, I think he's sort of taken it all on at Beer Quarry Caves, was saying that oh, yeah. the bats have started to appear already in the caves. You saw oh, some great. in there, I think it was oh, yeah. last week, so they've started. I was thinking, oh, well, well, it's quite wet out there, isn't it? I suppose they're starting to yeah Maybe. that's right yeah, we've, yeah so the, 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 and the temperature seems to have is, is dipped a little bit now isn't it so it does yeah, seem to be yeah, yeah. um, um i've been interested yeah i'm not sure um I, I don't know if richard knows the you know typically in, in previous years when when they've tended to you know start recording them in, in the you know in the autumn winter um or whether you know whether that's a little bit early for late september <clears throat> excuse me or whether that's that's normal i'm not i'm not sure but um certainly this change in weather i think will start yeah. making bats thinking about moving yeah moving into their kind of winter yeah winter roost sites yeah absolutely. and we had um Kathy was asking a question um how are the bats faring on the new housing site in Chudley where hedges were created by our team a couple of years ago did you would did you work on that um I haven't done a, a lot on I haven't no, I haven't worked on that particularly um I think yeah, to be honest, I'm not. I haven't seen latest kind of figures on that in terms of um, uh, yeah numbers of great orchids being being recorded. I mean, I know there was some concern. I think in um, in one of the areas around Charlie, in terms, of, I think one of the mitigation um, tracks or pathways that was put in, I think, is very overgrown, and I think some were worried that it might not, you know, <laughs> be passable for for bats in some places. So I think I know there's a bit of concern around that. Mm -hmm. um but I, but i must admit i don't um yeah i i haven't done any any recent kind of survey or, or heard any recent results from there um i think that's probably that's probably one that we can maybe follow up on because i think some surveys have been carried out by the, the chuddy wild group mm -hmm. um i think they've been doing some surveys this summer so that'd be good mm -hmm. they probably you know have have a bit of info on that but unfortunately i i yeah i haven't ha i haven't had any recent uh, records yeah. on that Kathy, so, sorry, sorry i can't answer that Kathy, would you mind private messaging me your email address and we'll find some info, info for you and get that back to you. You pop your email in there, I'll... Um, yeah, sorry, sorry uh, Kathy, I can't give you a nice answer on that one. Right, we tried, didn't we? We tried, we tried. Um, and I had another um, question. Do you, what are the key 
um, like challenges for landowners with, you know, really thinking about wildlife, thinking about, you know, that's as, but, you know, wildlife generally, I suppose. Um, and, yeah, so in terms of what might, you know, what sort of obstacles almost or what, um, yeah, what might, might be sort of stopping them doing other work. I think, um, I mean, there's probably a, a few things, aren't there? I think, I so suppose, you know, one thing I, I guess is, uh, I suppose it's education and sort of, you know, I guess knowledge of what the best thing to do is in, in a given situation. So again, I think that's something that obviously where we would, you know, and under my work would, you know, would, would come in and, you know, maybe that they're all the best of will, you know, to help out, but they don't really know, you know, what they should be doing. So I think that, that'd be kind of, you know, one, I guess, sort of mm -hmm. obvious perhaps starting point that we, we'd look to, to try and to try and help them with. Um, I, I suppose also it's, um, yeah, I mean, there are also you know financial challenges. If you we're talking about you know habitat creation, for example, if we thought, oh, that'd be a, you know great location for a new hedge, but obviously that you know that obviously costs you know that costs money. Um, so again, that that's again perhaps an, an obvious one. But but again, where we would hope as a project, you know, we would like to come in and try and help with that if, if possible. So if it was you know if we thought it was a really key location, then and, and as we have been doing with our our Batworks grants, um, you know, we'd help give you know help put some money towards that, you know, that new hedge creation or, 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 or whatever it was. Um, so that, that again, would be, would be something we'd look at. Um, I think, um, I mean, another one is almost like a, a cultural kind of thing, which is, particularly with sort of a, lot, a lot of farmers I've been working with, it's, it's that, um, again, with hedges in particular, it's that um, one needs to be kind of neat and tidy on hedge, hedges and actually for the you know if you, to benefit the bats you you, know, you want slightly taller and thicker and bushy hedge hedgerows um because they'll be easier for the bats to be you know feeding on, on insects on the, in those areas and also more of a physical structure for them to be using as they're um yeah as they're moving through the landscape so actually that kind of try to break that culture of our you know the farms always had neat and tidy hedges it's it's almost like a bit of farmer peer pressure sometimes comes into it and oh you know don't want to be the one seen to be letting my hedges get out of you know out of control so it's trying to get yeah get away from that a, li a little bit um and also i think some of the um the stewardship schemes that i mentioned that we we help farmers to go into um uh, which includes options to to manage their land for, for wildlife um sometimes they're like a little bit prescriptive so actually you perhaps want a bit more freedom so we you know they um you know, for example the best area of wildlife on their farm you know, might not fit kind of neatly into an option under the scheme sometimes it doesn't you know, there's sort of grey areas of rougher patches on the farm, which might be really good for wildlife, and um, and that's where you're getting a lot of the bats. But it doesn't fit into neatly into one of the, as I say, one of the options that are available under these funding schemes. So, if the, if the landowner is, you know, perhaps looking to do some good work, um, they might look to a, a stewardship scheme to get some funding to help them do that. But the scheme might not pick up their best areas, if you, if you see what I mean. Because sometimes yeah. they don't quite they don't quite kind of work out, which is, you know, we've you know we try and you know we talk to you know natural England and, and try and have input into the schemes to uh, to improve them where we can, um, but there's still there are those discrepancies where, uh, you know, the farm will show you an amazing bit of a really rough you know wildlife rich habitat, but it's you know the the grass is too high to qualify for that option or you know things like that. There's little little specifics that don't don't quite work. Um, so that can be a bit frustrating and can be a bit of a you know a, a challenge for the for the you know for landowners to who, who want to do the right thing but obviously need a little bit of perhaps financial assistance to to help them with that. Um, a question has come up in the thread about that actually. So somebody oh yeah. it says a a a j bell. So I hope I'm, I'm not sure who that is, but thanks. Oh, I think that's I think that's AJ. I think could we yeah we know each other from I've, okay I've, cool. I've, oh, yeah yeah. And AJ has said that um, Greater Hawtrey Batch returned to the winter roost at Bovey at Park at Bovey Tracy. Um, oh, yeah, great. That's a couple of weeks ago. Okay. And has also asked, could you explain a bit more? Um, I quite like that he spelt more M O O R. Nice, hmm. like it. Um, hmm. How to access grants? Because we've talked a little bit about, you know, how, you know, what are those challenges? You know, financial, and we've talked a bit about um potentially you know do, do you know of some sort of tips to give yeah i mean um 
and so the, the two kind of main i mean the main areas of grants i suppose the, the two i mentioned are um well the, the you know the batworks grant which is our own project grant but um obviously unfortunately you know now as we you know as we're coming towards the end of the project we you know we don't really have any more you know unfortunately don't really have any money left from from that from that part but that would um uh, previously that would have been towards you know small relatively small scale works um to benefit the bats so so other than that really you know we it's it is the countryside stewardship um grants which are um which tend to get so there's the mid-tier grants and there's like there's a high tier um you know scheme which is for kind of more you know uh species rich areas of land so perhaps areas that have got um designations of, of triple si <coughs> excuse me um and to national, you know, statutory designations. Um, that's very difficult to get into, but the mid-tier scheme is kind of open to everybody. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's one, it is, it is a bit of a minefield for negotiating sometimes. I mean, all the info is, is basically put online on the, um, the gov.uk uh, website. I've, I've just got a link, I'm going to pop Okay, it great, if you, if you can put that on. So that will have all, um, uh, there's, there's, you know, there's a manual and lists of, of options in there that you can have a look at, and work your way through. I mean, the manual is quite lengthy. It's, it's probably, I don't know, a couple of hundred pages. It's, it's, you know, it's a government document, so it's massive. Um, a lot of it you can kind of disregard, and, and um, the most important things are the, um, you know, which options to, you can you know, to choose. Um, and of, of those, again, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's quite a lot. But in any given one given farm, again, there's a lot of them you can kind of disregard. A lot of them sort of arable options, and, and options just won't be relevant for you. Um, so you can kind of you can kind of see there's probably a, a relatively limited set of options you can you can look at, um, and that's if it's anything like the last couple of years, it's been applying um, during the springtime. The schemes are normally kind of announced like February, perhaps February early March, and then you have until um, usually sort of the end of May to order your application pack, and then usually end of July to submit your application. Um, I mean maybe maybe it's one that um, you know, have a you know, I'm happy to have a chat with with AJ after you know, after this um, to have a, have a chat about that because it's, uh, it's it's not like a quick and easy <laughs> answer either. It's, you need to have a bit of a chat about what exactly you've got on you know, on the farm on, on the land, you know, what you want to do with it, um, and then see which options are going to fit. But um, uh, there's there's good fun. I mean, there's funding there, which I think if you're doing it, the overriding thing with it probably is if you're doing a lot of that work you know almost already or you're doing very similar work um then it's you know the scheme is really good for just getting a bit of funding to help towards that um if it's going to involve a lot of wholesale changes it's probably you need to think about it a bit more carefully as to make as to see whether the funding you're going to get is going to be you know it's going to be worth it in terms of the work you're going to have to do but um uh i think certainly if there's somewhere like where aj is talking about at um, a park then you know, conservation is going to be all uppermost in 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 what you know what you're thinking. So, um, you should definitely make use of these you know the mid tier grant um, to help give a bit of support towards what you're probably already doing in a lot of cases. So, as, as I say, I'm happy to to chat a bit more with AJ on you know afterwards if that would be helpful. That's great. Um, thank you. Thanks. There have been lots of thank yous in the thread. Um, thank yous from Vicky and um, no problem. <laughs> Carl. There's a couple of other I'll be quick because I know it's getting um, past eight now. Carla Dunn's asked, bats like nocturnes that use trees to roost. Are there specific known roost sites? Or um, could they be anywhere in appropriate trees? Is that so not nocturnes in particular was, was that? That was, Sorry, she, has said, she has said nocturnes in particular, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. I mean, there, um, yes, I mean, there, there will be some uh or the, obviously there will be known you know known roosts that they're, that they're using um uh I mean, they're fairly kind of wide so they tend to tend to need kind of good you know quite good areas of woodland quite um you know typically in, in quite extensive areas of woodland um often with kind of rivers nearby um they're often in old um so woodpecker holes they, they they tend to like to use um and uh, during the daytime, you can often you can hear them. So often, the first you know, sign you've got of a nocturnal roost is actually if you're walking through the woods, you can kind of hear like a chattering coming from a you know coming from somewhere around you. And, and you look up, and you might see a little hole, and that 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 could be you know a, a nocturnal roost. So 
Um, yes, yeah, so some obviously will, will be, you know, will be known about, will be found and, and recorded and, and, and monitored regularly. Um, but um, it's more obviously tree roosts and trees as they're kind of, uh, thinking of rotting trees as they're changing and obviously some will kind of fall down and the branches will fall off and whatever. So your roosts will be changing from a year to year. Um, you'll, you'll have different roosts occupied and, and, and others will become less suitable um, for whatever reason, as I said, if um, you know, a branch falls off the tree and physically it's no longer there or if the trees next to the roost um, you know, fall down or whatever and then suddenly there's more light around the roost and the bats might not like it. So roosts will, um, bats will use different roosts at, at different, the different um, from year to year. But, uh, but certainly, yeah, obviously some will be known about and some, you know, some, some won't have been found yet. Um, they, they do tend to, as I say, crop up in these kind of areas of woodland where there's not always, you know, good access. So I'm sure there's other roosts that are out there that, that, um, that we don't know about. Right. Thank you so much. And I'm just, loads of people have just put loads of their big thank yous and how great that was. Very interesting. Right, nice, my, my pleasure. Lots of thumbs up and <laughs> claps. That, and good. I'm glad everyone stayed around. I wasn't uh, wasn't bored by it. So that's, that's good. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Mike, for doing no that. Problem at all. My pleasure. Busy, busy, and you had all the conference and things last week as well. So just on behalf of kind of me and um, and everyone, thank you so much, and yeah, um, thanks no to problem. everyone for coming along. I mean. If it was just us lot out there helping the bats, we wouldn't get very wet far, would we, Mike? No, indeed. So that's, yes, exactly. That's probably I, I forgot to mention, but that's, that the whole point of what we're trying to do really is trying to enthuse everybody that so that when the project ends, unfortunately, it has to end. There's people out there who love bats and are going to do great things. So, yeah, yeah, it's really, it's really great. So it's great to. Um, great to know so many people are out there still doing it as well so thank you Definitely. thank you to everyone that came tonight and thanks for everything you do for wild i've had a little wave there from kathy hey <laughs> and thanks vicky yeah. i think vicky's tuned in all the way from america somewhere in the sort of central america so oh, fantastic good job, so, yeah good job you know, southeast out United States. Alabama, that was it. Wow. Alabama, I remember. Well, I, hope, well, I hope it was worth an hour of your time. I hope, hope you enjoyed it. Oh, I did. It was great. I visited Devin a couple of years ago and got interested in this project. So, yeah. Oh, great. Fantastic. Thank you. Great. Good yeah, no, no problem at all. The, the worldwide Greater Horseshoe Bat Project. That's <laughs> yeah, indeed. That's, yeah, we're, that's, we're spreading. It's great. That's, too, that's far too much to write on the t shirt, though. I think. <laughs> can't fit that in. That's, that won't fit in. This is long enough as it is, isn't it? But, um, Oh, thank you all so much. I'm going to, I'll just kind of I'll end you. it and, and then everyone ends. So thanks a lot, guys. Great to yeah, see you. Cheers. Thanks so much, Mike. Thank you so much. Bye. Cheers, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.